What happens if AI succeeds at its original ambition, which has all along been to go all the way, to produce the same general purpose, flexible learning and planning ability that makes us humans smart? Now, my view is that if this happens, it's not just one cool extra gadget, like one more little nifty technology. Uh, it really is a fundamental um, change in the human condition. We've had a few such changes before the agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution, but the transition to the machine intelligence era, I think, will be even more profound than these, and perhaps best uh, compared to the rise of Homo sapiens in the first place. If you think about it, it's some small differences in human intelligence that is responsible for all the other changes that we have seen playing out over the past 10,000 years or so. It's human intelligence that has invented all the other technologies that now produce this strange and unusual uh, modern human condition. And um, we are, at least I am, fairly agnostic uh, about the time scales here. Like, I just don't think that this is the kind of um, prediction that, that human beings have a very strong track record on being accurate about. We did do a survey uh, a couple of years ago uh, where we asked some of the world's leading AI experts um, a bunch of questions, one of which was this. Uh, by what year do you think there is a 50% probability that human-level machine intelligence will have been achieved? Now, we define human level here as the ability to perform almost any job, at least as well as a normal human being. This term, human level, is really perhaps slightly useful as a first approximation, but, but when you look closer, you really need to replace that vague concept with, with a more specific um, definition. Anyway, so uh, the answer we got to that, for what it is worth, is that the median opinion was that there was a 50% probability of this happening by 2050 or 2040, depending on precisely which group of experts we asked. So this was a limited survey. It's probably maybe the, the least unscientific survey that has been done. Um, others have been kind of informal polls at conferences, but still, you know, a relatively low response rate and such. So you should take this with a grain of salt. I think that the one conclusion one can draw from this is that uh, the idea of taking seriously that we might have uh, human-level machine intelligence in this century is, is not some ridiculous idea that no serious person has. Instead, it does seem to, as far as we can ascertain it, to be the mainstream opinion among people expert in the field. To me, it's obvious that there isn't like, a next step after that, which is superintelligence. And I think there's a fairly high probability that however long it takes to get to human-level machine intelligence, that superintelligence will follow relatively swiftly on from there. Um, People intuitively think of intelligence perhaps in, in, in terms like these, that, it's, that, that the range is spanned on one end by the village idiot and at the other end by Einstein or Ed Witten or whoever your sort of scientific hero is. And that, that this defines what is dumb and what is smart. And, and then maybe this makes sense for, for the human distribution. Our, our concept of smart, after all, is sort of derived from our experience of different humans and it's calibrated to... To, to make sense of what we see among humans. But if we're not thinking about the different intellectual strengths and weaknesses of humans, but instead thinking about how hard is it uh, to engineer a machine intelligence to perform at the particular level, I think the situation might look more like in, in this diagram here, where you have, you might imagine, at, at the left node there, the AI train starts with zero capability. Um, say, 70 years ago, you know, before you had computers, you really didn't have any AI at all. And then, after a lot of hard work by uh, a lot of um, AI researchers in many labs, uh, you eventually, perhaps, will get to mouse-level um, machine intelligence, like, say, something that can navigate the cluttered environment um, as, as well as a mouse. Um, and then, perhaps, after a lot of additional hard work on top of that, maybe you get to chimp-level AI and People might still think this is not a big deal. Then eventually you get to village idiot AI. I mean, who really needs like, more village idiots? You know, it's really not such a revolutionary thing, although they can do some things, like maybe they can drive trucks and stuff. Um, but uh, at that point, I don't think the AI train slows down. I think it just kind of may swoosh right past Humanville Station and, and, and zoom past um, Einstein-level intelligence. Like, 
the, the, the brain of the village idiot and the brain of Einstein are almost exactly identical. The same number of neurons, same number of circuits, same clock speed, more or less, you know, almost exactly the same. And these small differences in efficiency, you know, loom very large costs, and they result in a great difference in the ability to do scientific research. But from a fundamental um, computational perspective, they are probably very similar. So you might well get this phenomenon that it'll take a long time to get to human level, but maybe uh, no pause there, but just straight on to superintelligence. Um, there are a number of um, challenges that uh, remain to be solved if we're going to get to that point. And I mean, you heard uh, some people talking about this earlier today, like depending on precisely whom you ask, you might get a slightly different list of these. But, but certainly they would include things like transfer learning, the increased ability to uh, use insights and knowledge derived from you know, solving problems in one domain and using them in a different domain. That's something that you know, current AI algorithms are still struggling with a little bit. More flexible concept learning, um, reasoning with, with learned concepts, long-range uh, hierarchical planning, etc. In parallel to this, I think there's this uh, complementary set of challenges that will need to be uh, solved if we want to make sure um, that this very advanced AI will have a positive impact on the world. Like a set of challenges no less important and perhaps no easier to solve than those on the left side. Um, I won't have time to discuss all of these in detail, but one of them is the control problem. How could you engineer, supposing you could make an artificial agent really smart. How could you then ensure that this really smart agent will um, work on your behalf, that it will be aligned with human values? How can you ensure the safety of this kind of technology? Um, um, there are issues related to uh, technology races. If you have many developers, you know, a few decades down the road, kind of on the verge of developing this, what if there is a need to pass for a few months you know, in order to put the final set of safety mechanisms in place. Is that possible in a world where there are like a lot of different competitors running neck to neck? Um, um, distributional issues. Supposing we can solve the control problem, like then who decides what values are encoded in this? Um, cooperation in a world of multiple um, super intelligences. If, if you have um, a, a world where human labor becomes obsolete because you now have digital uh, entities that can perform more efficiently than humans and that can also be copied. So you quickly have a population explosion of this, these digital minds until the average revenue, the sort of marginal revenue that, that, that one of these can make just equals the electricity bill and the hardware rental cost. Like you have a Malthusian condition among the digital minds. Um, there is the question of what happens to humans then. We can no longer earn a living in some scenarios on, on uh, wages. We might have to live off of capital or, or, or wealth transfers, etc., uh, etc. Et so there are a number of these issues that, that look really, um, really important that, that the, our species will come to terms with. So I, I, I wrote this book, um, and I gather that copies will be distributed after. Um, um, and so... Um, it wasn't really meant to be a popular book at all. It has like a ton of footnotes, and I was really just trying to figure out as best I could um, what can we currently understand about how these dynamics might work out uh, and not argue for one specific thesis so much as trying to paint uh, uh, with as much granularity as possible um, you know, like a, a picture or build a model of, of some of the different aspects of this that seem tractable to analysis. Um, but if, if I want to put a few things that I believe that as a why I do think that, that AI has this enormous potential to, um, to do good. This is sometimes doesn't come across in, in sort of media coverage of, of, of the book. So I, I want to especially take the time to emphasize that. The reason I focus more on the downsides in the book is that it seemed to me at that time more urgent to develop a detailed, precise understanding of specific ways in which things could go wrong so that we can figure out how to avoid them, then it did to, to provide a very detailed picture of how things could go right. I think we can perhaps get by with a vague sense that there is an enormous upside there, um, where, whereas we do need a very fine-grained, detailed, correct understanding of the specific failure modes. Um, I argue that superintelligence raises unique issues. It's not just one more technology where we can just kind of copy and paste the insights and, and like 
habits we have for dealing with other technologies. This is not an inert piece of matter, like, 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 like a hammer or a missile. This is you know, not even an evolving piece of technology like a virus that can kind of adapt to our countermeasures. Uh, but this is like an intelligent piece of technology, in, in, in a bad case, an intelligent adversary that can anticipate our measures and plan around them. This is potentially a very different situation. Um, that there are possible scenarios in which superintelligent systems become very powerful, you know, ultimately for the same reasons that humans are very powerful, um, able to invent new technologies perhaps very quickly, able to anticipate human responses to create very powerful plans. Um, and I argue at some length that there are apparently adequate control mechanisms that nevertheless fail. That is, you think of this control problem that I alluded to. You think, ah, oh, well, all we need to do is this. We just need to put the AI in a box and disconnect the Ethernet cable. Or, or we just need to you know, train the, the AI to sort of be rewarded when it sees a human smiling. Or there, there are these, these kind of proposals that, that people come up with and that, that we can, for many of these, now see that they would fail. Catastrophically, and in fact, some of the progress that has been made in, in this kind of small, burdening field of AI safety studies is negative progress. In that, we now know that there are a number of superficially plausible ways to solve this problem that don't work. We, we don't, perhaps, yet have a good solution to the problem, but there are some blind allies that, that we, we now recognize as such. Um, and I recommend that we establish a field of inquiry to work on foundational and technical issues related to the control problem. This is. Uh, starting to happen to some extent. Um, there has been you know, a growth in, in this area um, over the last year, more funding. Um, Elon Musk gave some money. We got a grand big thing from the Leverhulme Foundation in, in the UK, and there, there's kind of increased interest in this. Um, uh, there's the beginnings of a technical research agenda specifically related to the, the uh, control problem, and uh, with a number of... So, so, so back when I got interested in this, like 10... 15, 20 years ago, there was this general sense, AI could be a big deal, somebody should think about it, maybe things could go wrong, we need... Uh, but the, 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 one of the sort of advances that has been made since then is to, to take this kind of vague bafflement sense that there is something there and begin to clarify the underlying concept sufficiently that you can now pick this big problem cluster apart and identify smaller problems, break those apart, and some of those to the point where you now have a technical research agenda, where you could imagine for some of these assigning a PhD student to, to do a thesis on some of these uh, that, that might actually turn out to be relevant um, to, 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 to these longer-term issues. And there are still other parts of this problem issue that, that remain kind of confusing and more philosophical, but some have now reached a point where they could be attacked by a theoretical computer scientist or mathematician. Um, so um, I think we should attract uh, top mathematics and computer science talent into working in this field. You know, not as many people as are working on making machines smarter, but you know, not 50% not, not of everybody should work on this, maybe not even 10%, but the 5% of the quality adjusted research effort went into AI safety. That, that would seem to be a, like a sane in investment for the world, for humanity to, to make. Um, it's crucial that we build strong research collaborations between this AI safety community and the AI development community. And, and so far that, that is going very well and, and we have great relations between key industry developers uh, and, and it's crucial that this remains. I mean, in fact, these arguably should not be separate communities and there, there should be more overlap. Some of, some of the same people should be both. Um, th there is a kind of failure scenario where each side begins to demonize the other and you get two polarized camps that, that you know, stand on opposite sides of a wall lobbing kind of rhetorical grenades that, that's not the way that humanity will solve this problem. We, we really need to work together uh, to do this. Um, and I suggest that in long-range scenarios, if you are interested in any other issue that, that is going to play out over multiple, if you're interested in global warming or the solvency of the pension system or which basic research to fund, um, geopolitical stability, in this, like in, in any kind of thinking that, that cares about long-term consequences, you should take into account... Um, you know, the possibility of superintelligence if you want to have a realistic, grounded view about what might happen in the century. Um, so there's the control problem. If we solve that, we then have the, uh, the privilege of confronting a bunch of other problems, the, the, the political problem of, like, whose value, the, 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 how to manage the impacts on the labor markets, like what actually to use this technology for. 
Um, that might be equally hard as the control problem or, or harder, but, but you have to have solved the, the technical control problem in order even to get a shot at this. Um, um, I argue that we, we could try to embed from an early stage the general uh, principle that, that superintelligence, if it is to be developed at all, should be developed for higher ethical purposes, for the benefit of all. It's not just one little cool gadget that should be used just to uh, boost the profit margin of one particular company or even to strengthen one particular nation. Um, all of humanity is in this together. We would all face the risks if somebody develops this, and it should stand to, to reason that we should all have some slice in the upside. So to try to foster a more collaborative um, uh, spirit also in, in how we think about um, using this in the long term could be a valuable thing. There are other issues here that I won't have time to talk about, but that are also potentially very important. If, if you think about it, if, if you actually take seriously the idea that you will have digital minds that have, have the same functional attributes, perhaps, as biological minds, first animals, then humans, then something else, it's not just then, at that point, about how we biological humans will be affected by, by these digital minds, like how these digital minds themselves fare in this new situation might be of great importance. There might be many more of these minds, ultimately, than there are biological minds. And so the ethics of artificial minds becomes possibly a very important frontier, where very little work has been done. Um, so the book tries to uh, begin to show how it is possible to... It, it doesn't pretend to have all the answers. It doesn't even try to argue for one specific possibility. But it does try to show that it is, that it is possible... To, to try to think hard and carefully and begin to clarify things and, and hopefully understand things a little bit better than we did at the outset. It's a kind of topic where you can do intellectual work on. Um, it's not just banging your head against the wall. You can begin to make some progress, even though there's a long way to go. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay.